Hello, my name is Burke Rosen, and this is the second lecture of the module on digital signal processing for the course Mathematical Foundations of Computational Neuroscience. So in the last lecture, we covered uh, the Fourier transform and uh, its use in looking at our data in the frequency domain. And today, we'll be extending that into looking at our data in the time frequency domain. And that's useful if you want to know the uh, frequency at which a phenomenon occurs and uh, have some information about when it occurs. So, for example, in this image over here, uh, we can see that about maybe a third of a second after stimulus onset, we have this strong uh, decrease or desynchronization in power at a uh, specific frequency band. And that's probably interesting, and we'd like to be able to uh, see that in our data. And uh, so the topics we are covering today are uh, three important signal transforms, the autocorrelation, uh, the cross-correlation, and convolution. Uh, I will then be covering uh, filters and filtering. And finally, I'll be going over three methods of time frequency analysis, the windowed or short time FFT, wavelet convolution, and the Hilbert transform. So let's start with the autocorrelation that's often denoted with a five-pointed star. And it is computed by taking the product of a function and itself with a time delay tau, and then integrating that over all samples. Because as we learned last time, uh, all digital signals are discrete. We're doing a numeric integration. Uh, so for example, if we have this crudely rendered signal here, and then we have it in these three uh, subplots with uh, different time delays tau, and, and here with tau of zero, uh, you will see that, uh, the, that the product is maximal when the, when the time delay tau is zero. Or, as indicated here, if your signal is periodic, and uh, then the uh, maximum value of the autocorrelation will be with tau is equal to one period, um, as well as zero, or any integer multiple of the period. And so the autocorrelation, because of this behavior, is most often used to detect periodic activity within a signal. So for example, I have uh, simulated a local field potential here. It's quite noisy. It looks like I've got two event-related potentials here. And I have computed the autocorrelation of the signal. So first we see that uh, there might be an oscillation with a period of 200 milliseconds. Um, but that's, I think, just our event-related potentials here, probably not really an oscillation. But this is interesting. Uh, it looks like there is an oscillation with a period of about 50 milliseconds um, hidden within this noise. So I might want to investigate that later. Uh, a... Uh, another use of the autocorrelation is to arrive at the power spectral density that we discussed in the previous lecture. So the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation is equivalent to the power spectral density. Uh, the intuition behind that being that if two time points which are close together are poorly correlated, then there must be a lot of high frequency power. Whereas if they're highly correlated, they're moving together on the same phase of a low frequency uh, oscillation. The second transform is the cross correlation, which is also denoted by a five point star. And the reason that it uses the same notation is because it's the same operation. The only difference is instead of having the same signal, it's applied to two different signals. And uh, it's most often used for uh, pattern matching, or uh, phrased more technically, uh, 
to find the temporal offset between uh, two similar signals. So here we have two signals uh, with, a, with a small temporal offset. And you'll notice this is the cross correlation. The signal is maximal with a lag equal to the temporal offset between the signals. So here's uh, another example. I have the same signal here. It's a little bit squeezed because it's a smaller plot. And then I created a template with a pair of Gaussians separated by 200 milliseconds. And I ran the cross correlation between these signals and it is maximal here at 800 milliseconds, at a lag of 800 milliseconds. And if I look at 800 milliseconds, that is about where this pattern would be. The maximum value of this pattern, uh, or maximum similarity of this pattern would be right here. Uh, interesting to note that uh, 200 milliseconds prior and after, we are matching half the pattern, so we get a, a correlation value that's about half of what our maximum correlation is, give or take the noise in the signal. Finally, we have convolution, which is denoted with a circle through an X with, through it, uh, or uh, also an asterisk. So this is uh, very similar to the cross correlation, but one of the signals is time reversed, and that's uh, denoted uh, with, by subtracting tau rather than uh, adding it. So in the, in the time domain, this is equivalent of computing a, a dot product, a sliding dot product at each sample. Uh, there are many uses of convolution. Uh, filtering uh, is a form of convolution, we'll get to that next, but uh, another use of convolution would be to predict the uh, calcium signal uh, from uh, spikes. So if the calcium impulse response, or kernel, is known, it is, uh, and we know when the spikes occur, we can convolve this uh, signal with this kernel and get and predict what the uh, calcium time course is going to be. So I mentioned that uh, calculating convolution in the time domain is a, ro is a uh, rolling dot product, uh, but it's not typically computed in that way. It's uh, typically much more efficient to compute it in the frequency domain. Uh, and that is the multiplication in the frequency domain is equivalent to convolution in the time domain. That's convolution theorem. And the way you do that is if you have your, your original signals, f and g, uh, you compute the Fourier transform of either signal and multiply that, those uh, vectors together and then uh, perform the inverse Fourier transform on the product. And that's uh, element-wise multiplication. So to summarize, we have our three transforms, autocorrelation, cross-correlation, convolution. Uh, they have similar forms. Uh, cross-correlation uh, is an autocorrelation with two different signals rather than the same signal and uh, convolution reverses uh, one of the signals. And this figure uh, comes from the Wikipedia page for uh, convolution, and uh, it's a very useful page quite in depth. So our next topic is filtering, which is an example of convolution. So uh, why do we filter data? We filter data in order to uh, either remove the unwanted parts of the signal or extract the wanted parts of the signal. So, and how do we filter? Well, filtering is convolution. Uh, so, for example, here is a, we have a 10 hertz kernel and we have four different signals. A 10 hertz signal, a 6 hertz signal, 35 hertz signal, and white noise. 
we can evolve these four signals with this kernel, these are our results. Uh, so we are letting uh, the 10 hertz signal pass through and attenuating all other signals. So we get a big signal uh, when we're filtering with this kernel, uh, the 10 hertz a sine wave, uh, and a smaller signal for 6 hertz and almost nothing for 35 hertz because it's quite far away from 10 hertz. And, and very little for white noise. There's some 10 hertz activity in the white noise signal by chance, uh, but not much. So uh, you may have heard of uh, using a particular order filter. What does order mean in this context? Order is the number of samples in the kernel, plus one. A higher order filter is going to usually have uh, better filtering char characteristics, which I'll get to later, uh, but requires more data to use because you have to have more data in your signal. You can't have a kernel that's bigger than your signal and uh, is going to be slower because there's more mathematical operations. Uh, so there's several types of filters. Uh, they can be identified by their frequency response curve or uh, also called a Bode plot. So uh, the, the amplitude of the signal that gets through the filter and per frequency. Uh, and this particular filter presented here is a low pass filter. So the pass band is in the low frequency range, that is, low frequency uh, information is allowed to pass through, and high frequency information is attenuated. It's in the stop band. Between the two, we have a transition band. So again, we have our simulated signal, and here's the low-pass filter. So this would be great for pulling out uh, the uh, event-related potentials, so, uh, cleaning up all that high-frequency noise. Another type of filter is a high-pass filter, which has a frequency response like this. So uh, it lets the high-frequency signals through and cuts out the low ones. Uh, it's uh, good for demeaning or detrending. Let's say that these aren't event-related potentials and these are um, uh, some kind of low-frequency artifact. Uh, we've gotten rid of them. Uh, uh, another interesting fact about uh, a, a, a high-pass filter is it will remove offsets. So this is, data is centered uh, at zero, but let's say it, it uh, was shifted uh, on the y-axis, a low-pass filter would remove that because the offset in a signal is equivalent to the power at zero hertz. Now, uh, whether it's better to uh, remove that offset with subtraction or with a high-pass filter is uh, currently uh, being debated um, there are uh, risks of artifacts for either method. Uh, perhaps the most common type of filter is band pass filter. So this has a specific band which passes through and frequencies both higher and lower than that band are attenuated. So here I've applied two different band pass filters to the signal. Uh, each of which are uh, have a, a 6 hertz passband. One is centered at 30 hertz and one is centered at 20 hertz. Uh, the, and we can see that there's a, a different pattern of activity in these two bands where the uh, 30 hertz signal is peaking at uh, around uh, bet or between uh, 500 and 600 milliseconds, uh, and the 20 hertz signal starts off strong and is more or less decaying. Uh, lastly, we have the band stop or band reject, or often called the notch filter. Uh, this is the inverse of a band pass filter, and uh, it is most often used uh, to remove line noise. Uh, line noise comes from alternating current. Uh, in the signal in uh, the United States, uh, this is 60 hertz. Uh, in Europe, it's 50 hertz. 
And in Japan, it, it depends uh, where in Japan the, the data was recorded. Uh, so here's an example of 60 hertz noise, and that can be notched out. Uh, you can avoid line noise uh, in your recording setup, but it's quite difficult. You have to you have thoroughly show the data and make sure that none of your equipment is running on uh, alternating current. This is why uh, most EEG setups run on batteries, which are uh, direct current. So, uh, an ideal filter would have a uh, zero width transition band. So you have your pass band and then any frequencies in excess uh, or, or lower uh, than that uh, pass band would immediately be attenuated to zero. In reality, uh, uh, the transition band uh, has, has a roll off, which can be either narrow or wide. And the, uh, uh, the precision of this transition band is one of the metrics which you use uh, to grade your filter. Others include uh, ripples in the passband. Uh, ideally, you'd want a flat passband. You don't want to bias your signal towards any particular frequency in your passband and the degree of attenuation. So compare this, uh, a good filter, this poor filter, uh, the attenuation is, is fairly mild in here. It's, it's powerful. Uh, filter design is heuristic, even in this uh, modern age. Uh, so um, when you're designing a filter, you have to explore parameters uh, with respect to your signal and come up with something that uh, provides the information you need while introducing uh, minimal artifacts. It's always a good idea to test your filter with simulated data. One of the most common artifacts are edge artifacts. Uh, so this occurs because filtering again is convolution. And what happens to your convolution uh, when your kernel is at the edge of your data? Well, it's, it's, if your kernel is centered on the last sample in your data, then you're convolving with a lot of nothing, which is going to introduce these edge artifacts. So you can predict how, how wide your edge artifacts are going to be from the order of your filter, uh, which is to say there'll be uh, half of the number of samples that are affected by edge artifacts will be half your filter order. Um, the solution for this is to collect more data than you need, and then uh, when you filter, you will still introduce edge artifacts, but then you can cut them off and have artifact-free edges in the data which you're interested in. So, I've been showing you the frequency response, like this, of filters, but filters also have a phase response, which is to say that they'll uh, cause phase shifts in different frequencies of the filter data. Uh, this can be corrected by filtering twice, one uh, with the original signal and one with the time reverse signal. That is to say you're convolving in either direction or in both directions. Uh, this is very useful, and most filtering in neuroscience is zero-phase filtering. However, there are consequences of zero-phase filtering. It cannot be performed online, because you need to have the data till the end so you can run the filter backwards. Uh, the filter gain is squared, and the effective filter order is doubled. Uh, causality can no longer be assumed, uh, which is to say that you have smearing, uh, you can have smearing both backwards and forwards uh, in your signal. So that means that the post 
fil the post-filtering data at any particular sample contain is influenced by samples both before and after it. And this can result in uh, activity uh, smearing into your baseline uh, in an event-related potential sort of experiment, for example. So all the properties I've been discussing so far are for finite impulse response, or FIR filters. Uh, there are also infinite impulse response filters uh, with names like Butterworth, Bessel, or Chebyshev. Uh, these are more computationally efficient, uh, so they can achieve similar properties with lower orders. Um, but uh, they are more difficult to design and are less intuitive. And their uh, detailed nature is beyond the scope of this lecture. Uh, and they often have a slow roll-off, as demonstrated here. Here we have a fourth order Butterworth and a uh, 150th order uh, FIR filter. And uh, you can see the, the uh, achieving similar levels of uh, stop band attenuation um, far above the pass band, but the roll off is, uh, is slower. And uh, lastly, uh, if you're not doing zero phase filtering, um, if you're doing one pass causal filtering, uh, IIR filters uh, phase response is uh, very is typically nonlinear and it's very difficult to design an IIR uh, filter with a linear phase response. Uh, so uh, IIR filters are best used um, in a uh, two pass zero phase uh, design. So we can uh, filter our signal. Um, but our, to extract our, the interesting part of our signal or to remove the uninteresting parts. But our, our goal for today was time frequency analysis. So how do we learn about at what frequency things are oscillating and when those oscillations occur? So we Recall from the previous lecture, the time frequency trade-off, that we can't have high precision in both. But we can sacrifice precision uh, in both to gain some information about uh, either. Uh, so there are, I'm going to cover three methods, the short time uh, Fourier transform, wavelet convolution, and the filter Hilbert method, typically with a bandpass filter. So, uh, with carefully chosen parameters, these three methods will reduce mathematically to each other. Uh, they can all accomplish the same thing. Um, but in typical designs, uh, the short time Fourier transform has the highest frequency precision and lowest time precision. And the uh, filter Hilbert uh, method has the highest uh, time resolution and lowest frequency resolution and wavelet convolution is somewhere in between. So first, the short time Fourier transform. This is, I think, the, the easiest to understand. Uh, it is uh, very similar to Welch's method, <laughs> which we covered in the uh, last lecture. So we have our data, we cut it into windows, we perform the FFT on each window. But instead of averaging them together to reduce variance, uh, we concatenate them uh, to form a time series. Uh, these windows are most often overlapping, but they, they don't have to be. And uh, they often have uh, window functions applied to them, um, like uh, the uh, uh, hand function. Uh, in this method, the time frequency trade-offs are encoded in the windowing parameters. So if you have uh, long windows, you have less temporal precision and more spectral precision. 
The second method is wavelet convolution, particularly with Morlay or complex wavelets. So a, uh, a Morlay wavelet is a Gaussian uh, convolved with a sinusoid. Uh, and it is, um, this is the real values of the, of the Morlay wavelet, but it's an analytic signal, so it has both real and complex values. So this is a 3D representation of the complex signal with um, time being on the, on the diagonal here, and then uh, phase and amplitude, or frequency and amplitude uh, being on the other two axes. So it is essentially filtering with a complex kernel. And when you uh, convolve a signal with a complex kernel, you receive or yield a complex or analytical result. The wavelet, and therefore its time frequency trade-offs, is defined uh, by its mean frequency and its uh, spectral or temporal standard deviation. Uh, each of the standard deviations um, uh, define the other. Um, there are uh, two ways wavelet convolution is generally used. You can have a, a single coarse wavelet uh, shown here, which covers your entire passband, and then that's uh, quick. You only have to do one convolution. Uh, but you're biasing your signal towards the center of the uh, of the uh, uh, passband of the wavelet. Uh, if you have multiple wavelets, you can uh, shift them in frequency space and have a flatter passband. Now, uh, a or if you extend this, uh, you can build up the activity at various frequency bands. And that's how we get our time frequency information. A single wavelet convolution is going to tell you only about the changes in power in a single narrow band. Whereas many wavelets uh, used together can tell you information about the time course of many frequencies of activity. The most recently uh, developed method is the filter Hilbert, uh, which is a two-step process. First you band past your signal and then you apply the Hilt Hilbert transform uh, to extract the analytic signal uh, or complex signal from the uh, uh, band past uh, data. So uh, what the Hilbert transform does more or less is extract the envelope of the signal. So here we have a band pass signal its real and imaginary components, and uh, we apply the Hilbert transform and that can get us the amplitude of the signal. The amplitude of the bandpass signal is a measure of the uh, amount of activity in the bandpass frequency range over time. And similar to the wavelet, if we have many, if we do this many times, we can build up the changes in uh, power at many frequencies over time. And that can yield a spectrogram. So uh, this is the plot of our time frequency data. So we have both uh, time, frequency, and uh, power or amplitude depending on uh, uh, how it was calculated. So the short time Fourier transform, uh, each Fourier transform 
fills a column in the data. So for a single time window, we, we gain information about all the frequencies. And when we do the short time Fourier transform, we're doing multiple windows to fill in all the columns of the spectrogram, uh, where in instead, in the case of the wavelet convolution or the Hilbert transform, uh, we are calculating each time the change in uh, power over time for a narrow frequency band. And if we perform this operation multiple times, we can start to fill in the rows. And they can, uh, in this way, achieve uh, essentially uh, equivalent results. And that's time frequency analysis. Now, I mentioned that for um, Morley wavelet convolution and the Hilbert transform, and uh, really for the Fourier transform as well, uh, we uh, can ex we we get a complex signal which contains both a real and imaginary component. Uh, now, using the relationship between the real and the imaginary component, we can extract the phase of the signal. Uh, the more or less instantaneous phase of the signal in the case of a wavelet convolution and the Hilbert transform. So uh, by taking the arctangent between the imaginary and real components, uh, this is the MATLAB code here, uh, we can acquire the phase of the band pass signal at any time. And uh, that is most useful uh, for uh, multivariate measures like phase locking value uh, between two channels, uh, although it could also be used for phase amplitude coupling uh, uh, within a, a single channel. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go over uh, these techniques. Um, but if you can extract the uh, complex time frequency signal from uh, your data, you are well on your way to achieving those. So I talked about uh, signal transforms, um, the autocorrelation, cross-correlation, and convolution. And in particular, I, I spent time talking about a special case of convolution, which is filtering. Uh, I then moved on to time frequency analysis, and we went over the three principal methods used for time frequency analysis in neuroscience. The short time FFT, wavelet convolution, and the Hilbert transform. Uh, I've included a couple useful links here, uh, one on uh, the MATLAB documentation for filter design. So MATLAB has some pretty good tools, uh, graphical uh, tools for designing filters, uh, and uh, Google searches tend to be pretty fruitful for filter design because uh, filtering is a very common process used in many fields. Uh, lastly, I'd like to recommend uh, entry to mid-level textbook on neural signals analysis uh, by uh, Michael X. Cohen. Uh, it's about 50 bucks on Amazon. Uh, it, it's a very approachable and, and, uh, and practical. Uh, and uh, I keep a copy on my desk. So uh, that's all for digital signal processing. Thank you for listening.